In this roundup of a week, as large parts of the world continue in lockdown, critical voices are beginning to be heard on both sides. Did we act soon enough on the one side? Have we gone too far on the other side? We'll discuss both. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Welcome once again to the worldwide experiment, the slice of history in the making that is 2020. I hope you're doing well, surviving and thriving as best as you can through these interesting times. Last week, I raised the question of how long the respective systems, particularly of the various democratic nations, would hold discipline to stay under lockdown. Certainly a week longer, as we've seen. And so far, there aren't too many signs of countries at risk of the social consensus in favour of action collapsing just yet. It's the sort of thing that may happen over months rather than weeks. But one thing we have seen is that voices are starting to be raised to question the mainstream strategy being followed by the worst affected countries. Lots of people aren't happy about that. There's a wartime spirit that says that when you're in the midst of a crisis, you don't criticise. You get on and do what the country has to do. All the analysis and reflection can follow later when the danger is past. But as several commentators have pointed out, this may be a crisis, but it's not actually wartime. There is no enemy listening in, looking to expose our divisions and to adjust their strategy to exploit our weaknesses. And accordingly, while we consent to extraordinary measures we otherwise wouldn't go along with, it should not be held to be disloyal or unhelpful to ask some hard questions and to seek to hold governments accountable for their actions. Unless you live in Hungary, of course. Because in Hungary, the Prime Minister Viktor Orban has done away with all that democratic accountability and now has time unlimited power to rule by decree. He can jail anyone deemed to be spreading misinformation. What could possibly go wrong? And unsurprisingly, no one is much predicting that a rapid handing back of those powers is going to take place after the epidemic is over. So far, the European Union, suddenly waking up to news of actual dictatorship in their ranks, is responding in a remarkably feeble way. Probably because, of course, everyone's really focused on what's happening in their own national boundaries in relation to the coronavirus. And on that score, let's face it, there hasn't been a huge amount of good news this week. Italy and Spain continue to see large daily death rates and in the US, President Trump has been moved pretty solidly from his early enthusiasm about reopening everything for Easter to the grim recognition that the next couple of weeks are going to be tough. New York is arguably now the world epicentre for the virus. If you take the number of deaths and compare them to the size of a population, New York now has a slightly higher percentage of deaths per capita than Spain or Italy. Now, that may or may not be true. Nobody trusts the figures that came out about the impact of the coronavirus in China, for one thing. And in any case, the thing that's become obvious is how people are counting deaths and cases does vary enormously, which is one reason why the percentage of death rates differ so wildly between countries. In Italy, the percentage death rate has been 11%. In Germany, it's 0.6%. Now, obviously, there's no way that a virus decides that it likes killing the citizens of one country more than the others. And even though the demographics of some populations, in terms of the number of older people and people with poor health, those things can vary between countries. But on its own, it's not a big enough difference to explain the gulf that there is in those figures. But of course, what it does show is that from country to country, different amounts of testing are done. If you only test people that are sick enough to end up in hospital, then you're selecting your test sample for those that are seriously ill in the first place. And in that case, you're bound to get the higher death rate percentage. Whereas if you do more widespread and random testing, then you get a lot of people who have only mild symptoms or who are completely asymptomatic. And that will naturally give you a lower percentage. Nobody's doing what you would have to do to get a real picture of what percentage of people die from this disease. Because to do that, you would need to test a statistically representative sample of randomly selected citizens to learn what percentage of them have the virus and have died from it. Even countries that have more testing capabilities, such as Germany, have not been doing that. 
because they have a limit to the amount of testing they can do. And not unreasonably, they're focusing that on where it will have the most practical value. Now, having said all that, Iceland have said that it will now begin to test all its citizens, which it probably can do because its entire population is so small, around 340,000. And maybe that will give us then some interesting and useful information. The lack of current data is giving space for some to question whether global society might be massively out of whack in its belief about the virulence of the disease. A handful of people have been arguing that if you look at certain evidence, it's not killing any more people than the annual flu, and therefore we're shutting down all of our societies and doing immense damage to people by completely sabotaging the economy without sufficient cause. Intuitively, you have to look at the situations in Italy, in Spain, in New York, as well as elsewhere, and say, it's surely completely wrong. After all, we're seeing hospitals overwhelmed by cases, requirements for thousands of additional ventilators, countries like the UK creating large new makeshift emergency hospitals to cope with thousands of patients above what the existing capacity can support. We're seeing doctors, nurses and other frontline staff getting sick in reasonably large numbers, some of them dying. We've seen a worldwide scramble to obtain and manufacture protective equipment, very little of which is being hoarded in someone's loft. It's all being used and there remains a massive shortage. And we're seeing people we know get sick. Almost never does annual flu hit any of my circle of friends, but I've had three people I know sick with it in the last couple of weeks. And yesterday, sadly, another friend lost his father to the virus. And you can add to that the growing toll of the more famous names that we've seen. Now, you can dismiss all that bit as being anecdotal. And of course it is. But it's definitely not business as usual. But fair enough. What do the figures suggest? Are we seeing death rates massively up because of coronavirus above and beyond what we normally see at this time of year? In the UK, we've seen the argument being made that we're not. One critical voice, Dr John Lee, had this to say. Statistically, we would expect around 51,000 to die in Britain this month. At the time of writing, 422 deaths are linked to COVID-19, so 0.8% of that expected total. On a global basis, we'd expect 14 million to die over the first three months of the year. The world's 18,944 coronavirus deaths represents 0.14% of that total. These figures might shoot up, but they are right now lower than other infectious diseases that we live with, such as flu. Not figures that would, in and of themselves, cause drastic global reactions. He suggested that one of the reasons for the gulf between the statistics and the reality on the ground comes down to how the deaths are recorded. The majority of deaths have come from people who have underlying conditions. But generally, people in that situation end up with several problems at once when they die. And the thing that actually kills them may be the flu or other seasonal infections, but we don't test for those. We attribute the death to the underlying condition. Therefore, in this version, what we're really seeing is that because coronavirus is highly infectious, and there's no question about that, most of its impact is to seek out those who are likely to have died anyway and hasten them on their way in a way that gets recorded as a coronavirus death rather than a death due to cancer or heart failure or whatever it might have been. People that would have died quietly in a different ward, surrounded by their grieving family, are instead ending up on a ventilator in a special ward that the whole world is watching to see what's going on. Of course, some perfectly healthy and robust people are sadly being caught in this as well. But statistically, you have to be really unlucky to get that bullet. With the figures that Dr Lee gave, that is a powerful argument. However, this is a rapidly unfolding situation. And although we love jumping to early conclusions and deciding that it means that we know more than all the apparent experts running around, nobody knows any of this for sure. Seriously. If anyone tells you they definitely know what's going on, they're either lying to you or they're deluding themselves. The data is either not there or not yet reliable, which is why governments have to make the best decisions they can based on what they have. So, for instance... Contrary to Dr. Lee's view, there's this piece of information sourced from an Economist article, which is behind a paywall, unfortunately. But it purports to show that in actual fact, if you look at certain places in Spain, the actual death rate is significantly higher than both the background normal plus additional numbers attributable to COVID-19. 
The message from that data is that it seems likely that lots of deaths where COVID-19 has been a factor aren't being added yet to the headline statistics at all. Now, it's worth noting that both of these come from specific locations within Spain. I'm not sure that they represent a large enough sample size to have rogue factors affecting the apparent results. But it's a perfect illustration of the nature of the uncertainty. Another case in point is the fact that the figures for deaths for France had an astonishingly high one-day leap yesterday. The sort of leap that would make you start digging to discover what on earth happened. And you find out that what actually happened wasn't that a whole bunch of people suddenly died yesterday. It was that deaths over the last couple of weeks that had taken place in nursing homes had not been included in the overall death total. And now, realising that figures were therefore too low and had been for some time, they have been added to the figures in all in one go. And it just underlines the quality of the data isn't good enough to jump to conclusions just yet. But nevertheless, the question is being asked. Have we gone too far? How much different would it have been in terms of the outcome if we'd isolated those in vulnerable categories, which is a significant slice of people, don't forget, and encouraged everyone else to carry on with their lives, but with some new standards of behaviour for what you might describe as light social distancing? And some people have responded to that suggestion by saying, but more people would surely have died that way and even if it's just a few people the unlucky healthy people who do badly then every life matters the people asking the question have two different responses to that the one that most of them agree on is that the argument that societal lockdown is going to kill a whole bunch of people as well dr lee again the moral debate is not lives versus money it is lives versus lives it will take months perhaps years if ever before we can assess the wider implications of what we're doing the damage to children's education the excess suicides the increase in mental health problems the taking away of resources from other health problems that we were dealing with effectively those who need medical help now but won't seek it or might not be offered it and what about the effects on food production and global commerce that will have unquantifiable consequences for people of all ages, perhaps especially in developing economies? The difference is that on a daily basis, we see the statistics for those who died of coronavirus. But those other deaths are in the future, and therefore right now, pretty much invisible. Who knows under which scenario we would see the most suffering and death? And the honest answer is, we don't know. And of course, the counter argument is that the consequences of the shutdown can still be addressed by government. There will be numerous negative consequences, but an effective government supported by proactive businesses and an engaged population of citizens, those impacts can be reduced. Whereas the virus doesn't negotiate with anybody. So that's one line of argument. The other, expressed most directly by the columnist Toby Young, comes down to the efficiency of the use of resources. It's actually an extension of Dr Lee's position, but by putting a price onto life, it becomes a rather more controversial beast. And it has been an explosive contribution that saw him trending at number one on Twitter a couple of days ago, which is rarely because everyone's tweeting how much they appreciate you. Toby Young is someone who does enjoy the role of contrarian, so he chooses not to mince his words. Spending £350 billion to prolong the lives of a few hundred thousand mostly elderly people is an irresponsible use of taxpayers' money. That may sound cold-hearted, but this isn't a straightforward trade-off between public health and economic health. People are killed by economic downturns just as surely as they are by pandemics, and more years of life will be lost than saved if lockdown is prolonged. He asked the question, what's the price of a human life? And of course, as we've said, lots of people respond to that with outrage, suggesting that there is no price, no price whatsoever that can be put on a human life. And in one sense, of course, that's true. But as Young points out, that's not the way we currently do it. Any finite healthcare system, however well resourced, will ultimately find that demand outstrips supply and therefore it either makes a rational decision on how much to spend on giving someone an extra year of life or else it simply allows those decisions to be made by default and without any rationale, in which case they won't be consistent. The UK's National Institute for Clinical Excellence, NICE, which takes decisions on what new drugs or treatments to fund, places a value of £30,000 on each quality-adjusted life year. 
Toby Young points out that if the modellers have been completely correct about the number of lives that a full lockdown will save, which would be 230,000 people, then the £350 billion the government's committed to pay out for the crisis provides a cost per life of half a million pounds each. He makes certain assumptions about how many years the majority of victims had left anyway, but even if you adjust those more optimistically, say that each life saved would enjoy 11 high-quality additional years, you end up with numbers significantly higher than the nice figures at £330,000. Now, you can see how that argument might go down. And there is a difference between the amount of health budget an institution may be prepared to make available for a novel drug or treatment and the price of a life. They actually aren't the same thing. But of course, what both of these arguments, but certainly Young's do, is the healthcare equivalent of the self-driving car dilemma. If you're a human being driving a car, and you suddenly end up in an accident situation where if you swerve one way, you save the life of a child, and if you swerve the other way, you save the life of three adults, you will do it on instinct. And whatever you do, probably no one will blame you for that split-second decision. And let's be honest, most of you would probably swerve wildly in panic and mow them all down. I know that's probably what would happen if I was in that situation. But if you're designing the software for a self-driving car... Well, suddenly you have to program in what the car should do in that situation. Something that would have happened by default and on instinct suddenly becomes a policy. And that is really hard, morally tough. And as soon as you expose that choice to the necessity of policy, it becomes a calculation that will make a lot of people squirm. And so it is with health policy. However much money you have to spend, you can never afford to treat everybody in the optimum possible way. Generally, those decisions get taken relatively quietly. In the current situation, the consequence of not asking the question are likely to be a lot higher. And even though Young was roundly vilified by many in the couple of days since his article, we're starting to see mainstream discussions forced into that area already. Old people's homes, for instance, are being told that their residents won't be taken to hospital if they catch the virus. Because the brutal reality is that if you're in an old people's home, you're frail, the amount of time you have left is scant, the quality of life is questionable, your chance of surviving is pretty slim. No one's spelling it out that way, we're just quietly not taking those people into hospital. So the question, would we have been better off shielding the vulnerable and allowing everyone else to carry on as before, but with a bit more social distancing? Right now, we may be able to get the answer to that question in due course, because that's exactly the policy being followed by Sweden. They've been shielding the vulnerable. If you have any symptoms, you self-isolate. They banned gatherings of more than 50 people, and they've banned stand-up bars, insisting that bars and restaurants have to offer table service only. But other than that, life goes on. Now, how much difference has that made? As with all of these data points, it's too early to tell. Sweden has a couple of major cities, but otherwise it has a relatively small population, relatively well spread out. So it's been slow to get going. But if you look at its figures right now, it's in the same upward curve as everyone else. Now, that's exactly what you'd expect at this stage. The question really is this. As the countries that locked down get to the top of their respective curves and begin to bring the cases and the deaths down, will Sweden follow the same track at broadly the equivalent time in their journey, which would indicate that the lockdowns made very little difference? Or will they keep going up, enduring a sharper and harder to control spike? Even if they introduce a lockdown today, the shape of the curve should still give us some information. Now, as always, there can be more than one variable at play, and what works in one country doesn't always translate to others. Even so, right now, if you look at the death rate per head of population, Sweden has a higher death rate than neighbouring Norway, but significantly still below countries that have been hotspots for longer, such as Italy and Spain, the UK and France. Right now, although, as you would expect, some voices are raised to protest the government's approach in Sweden, by and large, the population continues to support it. So those are some of the most telling arguments. Some of the critics wander beyond those questions and are pushing some rather more questionable claims. For instance, Dr. Sukarit Bagdi, a Swiss doctor in Germany, had a video go viral when he talks about the tragedy of Germany's lockdown, 
claiming that coronavirus is no worse than the flu. He made this argument to suggest that the death rates in China and Italy did not apply to Germany. Dass dieses passiert bei Covid-19 ist nicht nur falsch, sondern gefährlich irreführend, weil dadurch vergisst man, dass viele andere Faktoren, lokale Faktoren, mit einer entscheidenden Rolle spielen können. Zum Beispiel, was eint Norditalien mit China? Was haben sie gemeinsam? Frage, Antwort, die horrende Luftverschmutzung, die die höchste in der Welt ist. China ist, also Italien ist eigentlich China Europas. Die, die Lungen der Menschen in diesen Gebieten sind ganz anders vorbelastet und erkrankt als unsere Lungen. This led certain commentators to grasp this rather simplistic hypothesis and uncritically embrace it. He explained that the lungs of people in northern Italy are chronically injured from the air pollution. And he described the government response to the virus as being tragic. Governments have been focused on reducing carbon dioxide levels rather than actual pollutants. My sister used to live in Wuhan and the air there is filthy, as it is in New York City. On the other hand, my former home of Boulder County, Colorado has relatively clean air and they've had no COVID deaths. Unfortunately, even the data we have doesn't seem to support it. If you look at statistics for deaths from air pollution, which you would expect to mirror the effect that BACD is suggesting, you find that the north of Italy is significantly better than Wuhan, China, and is slightly better than Germany. And Spain, the other big hotspot, is a lot better than all of them. And as for the suggestion that the air in New York is, to quote, filthy, that would suggest that any major city with lots of traffic would also qualify. Well, every country has a major city with lots of traffic, so it becomes a meaningless distinction. So far, there's no observable correlation with air quality and deaths. There is correlation between population density and catching the disease at all, which is rather more the point why Boulder, Colorado might not have had deaths at the time of that video, although it's had a few since. If you've watched such videos and as a result decided it's just fine to go about your business, regardless of what the local authorities say, I would just think again. Don't let someone else's slack attention to detail and desire to be the contrarian voice be the thing that gets you to take risks that may put the people you care about in danger. So those are the sceptics on one side. They're the more interesting arguments, which is why I've spent the most time on them. Inevitably, there are those on the other side, criticising their governments for having moved far too slowly and hence having put their people at risk. Richard Horton the somewhat radical editor of The Lancet, has been typical of the critics of Boris Johnson's government in the UK. The UK government's contain, delay, mitigate research strategy failed. It failed in part because ministers didn't follow World Health Organization's advice to test, test, test every suspected case. They didn't isolate and quarantine. They didn't contact trace. These basic principles of public health and infectious disease control were ignored for reasons that remain opaque. There are two things here. One is the we all knew this was coming long ago and the government did nothing. So criticising a slow start. And then the second one is simply what's being done isn't being done well enough. The first one's the most widespread and for me it's the one that's easiest to make but almost never do those making it stand up to scrutiny in terms of their own foresight. We can all do it in hindsight. In fact as I've said before whenever you get a single initiative that was good you can always criticise it with a comment, should have been done sooner. It's completely unfalsifiable, only of value if there are forces pushing for earlier activity within the system and the system failed to work as it should, which is not the case here. And let's take Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet, as a case in point. He argued that it was quite clear back at the end of January that things were going this particular way and that the government had therefore been criminally incompetent not to be taking action. But that's not what he was actually saying at the time. On January the 24th, he tweeted this. A call for caution, please. Media are escalating anxiety by talking of a killer virus and growing fears. In truth, from what we can currently know, 2019 NCOV has moderate transmissibility and relatively low pathogenicity. There is no reason to foster panic with exaggerated language. He then added a further tweet. 
praising the actions of authoritarian China for clearly acting early and communicating totally transparently. And when one examines the global response to 2019 NCOV, Chinese authorities have acted quickly and decisively to control the outbreak. They have shared information rapidly and transparently. Meanwhile, WHO has been impressive, clear and confident decisions and communication. So fabulous 2020 hindsight there from the Lancet editor, who's also coincidentally a big supporter of Extinction Rebellion, which turns out to be handy because XR's Rupert Reid has also been making a profile for his precautionary principle rhetoric on the coronavirus. Indeed, Rupert had a mini viral moment of his own this week when a video he made to call Boris Johnson a liar got over half a million views. Here's a bit of that. Fellow citizens of this great country of Britain, I'm here to tell you that you're about to be deceived deliberately by your own government. A letter will soon come through your door from them telling you that unless you get more serious about locking down, the government is going to tighten the lockdown that we are all under. They are trying to put the blame on you for this public health disaster of the coronavirus and for the lockdown needed, it is indeed needed, in response to that disaster. In the letter, Prime Minister Johnson says, quote, from the start, we the government have sought to put in the right measures at the right time. The truth is very different. The truth is that the government have for two months systematically flouted World Health Organization advice on how to deal with this pandemic, and that in some respects they are still doing so now. My name is Dr. Rupert Reed. A few weeks ago, I coordinated a letter, a version of which was published in the Daily Mail. It was signed by the editor of Britain's foremost medical journal, The Lancet, and by the former chair of the House of Commons Science Select Committee. Now, the government should have acted well before receiving our letter. They should have moved already to stop flights coming in from Italy and China. Quite a few of the people who saw that seemed to get confused and thought that Dr. Rupert Reed was a medical doctor. And the fact that the first thing he mentions is his joint letter with the editor of The Lancet didn't exactly dispel that misconception. Which may be why it went viral. I mean, a medical doctor saying your government is lying to you is obviously a lot more powerful than an Extinction Rebellion spokesman with a degree in philosophy saying it. But that may be my own cognitive bias kicking in there. It is a powerfully worded video. It could well be it just went viral on its own merits. So credit to him for spreading his message. Although he should add a note making it clear he's not a medical doctor. Ultimately, the argument that says that Johnson is blaming the British people for the lockdown is simply made up. He is saying nothing of the sort. It would be politically stupid for him to say such a thing. And whatever he is, opinions vary, he's not that. There are arguments to say that the government is not executing as well as it should do. And if you look at the situation that there's been on the promises of increased testing and the problems they've had actually increasing testing because of shortages in materials and so on, clearly there have been some problems in execution. And that is perfectly fair comment to criticise, frankly. When we look at the incredible work that people are doing on the front line, any failings of government to do what they say they're going to do and support them are perfectly valid for criticism. The arguments in the UK mirror, of course, those in the US. Because of Trump's style, he gave rather more hostages to fortune with his various statements in the early days about how under control everything was and how nobody need worry about anything and how Easter would be a beautiful time when everyone could go to church together. Ultimately, the US problem is going to come less from Trump's lateness to the party than it is from the relative separateness of the states. So some have locked down, others have not. Some are taking it massively seriously, others, well, to some degree less so. Arguably, while Europe has much diversity across its nations and everyone looks to the nations that are doing well and the ones that aren't, the US has similar diversity in many ways across the states, but is nevertheless treated as one country. So while New York may have hit the top of a particularly horrible curve, the rest of the country may well remain some way behind. The process of catching up probably means the curve of the US overall as a whole entity will continue to look horrible for longer than you have seen elsewhere. And that's going to be rather important in an election year. All right, very quickly, 
In other news, the COP26 conference on climate change has been postponed, as predicted several weeks ago on this very channel, which was a pretty easy prediction, I admit. Coming next week, my bold prediction that the sun will continue to rise in the morning and to fall in the evening. The postponement's just as well, because the early news coming in to the process wasn't exactly great. As you may recall, this is the time when the signatories of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change are expected to submit their increased, more ambitious targets for the next few years. Japan have submitted their plan. And, well, it hasn't changed its target at all. Sticking to 26% emission reductions by 2030. Russia have also come in with their plan, and it's promising to, wait for it, increase its emissions. It dresses this up as cutting emissions by a third compared to 1990. 1990 was when the Soviet Union collapsed. So it's as cynical an exercise you could get, choosing the absolute peak of historical emissions and using that as your starting point. Vladimir Putin is obviously a mean hombre who takes his shirt off a lot. Not the kind that nice teenager Swedish girl should be going anywhere near. As I've said numerous times now, the real politique of global politics means that countries like China and India would be unlikely to commit to bigger cuts without some sort of a deal to make it worth their while. And they probably want to hold out anyway until the US election. So the delay may at least remove that one factor from the equation. But anyone who thinks this to be a point of major progress, COP26, they've got their work cut out for them over the next 12 months. Finally, some good news on the natural world. This week we learned that we're seeing more ways to improve the health of the oceans. There's been a major recovery of the humpback whales and other sea life over recent years. Save the Whale was one of the iconic environmental campaigns when I was a younger man. Not one that I can take any credit for. But, well, they saved them. Well, for now, anyway. They were down to a few hundred in 1968, and they've increased by 10% per year since hunting them was banned, and now they're at more than 40,000. Grey whales have gone from 4,000 in 1949 to 20,000 and blue whales from a mere 1,000 in the 1950s to around between 10 to 20,000 today. Northern elephant seals were down to 20 breeding pairs but now there's more than 200,000 of them, presumably all closely related but we won't judge. There's lots more to do, of course, and some of it is being done. And in the UK, we're also seeing a revival of some of the birds that had declined somewhat in recent past. Sparrows, goldfinches, wrens, long-tailed tits, coal tits, all of them on the up. I feed the birds in my garden and I see all of those varieties, amongst others, so that makes me happy. I hope you find lots of things to make you happy this week. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show.